Kevin Cowan is president of TSX Markets and group head of equities, TMX Group. Kevin joined the Toronto Stock Exchange's Canadian Dealing Network in 1997 as general counsel. Since 97, Kevin has been closely involved in the transformative changes that have, have occurred in the Canadian public markets, serving as director of the Canadian Dealing Network, senior vice president of TSX Venture Exchange, senior vice president business development of the Toronto Stock Exchange, and president of TSX Venture Exchange. Kevin assumed his current role in 2008. Today he will talk to us about moving from the potential merger of TMX Group with the London Stock Exchange Group to the conclusion of an acquisition of TMX Group by the Maple Group Acquisition Corporation. He will also talk about the objectives and motivations for M&A activity among global exchange groups and what this means for Canadians. So please welcome, join me in welcoming Kevin to the podium. Kevin. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Just seeing if we can uh, make the technology cooperate. I did bring a couple of uh, big picture slides today. If they don't work out, that's fine. But we'll just give it a moment here to see if uh, we can do that. Aha, looks like we're in business. Well, good afternoon, everyone, um, and thank you very much for the, uh, for the introduction. It's a uh, tremendous uh, pleasure to be here today, and in some ways, uh, rather fitting. Uh, the, the last time that I was in this exact room, um, I had spent, the, it was a Monday night, I'd spent the morning in Calgary, um, where I was before an audience not unlike this. I was with Luke Bertrand, who was heading up the Maple Acquisition Corporation, um, Luke and I were both presenting. I was presenting the merits of the London Stock Exchange merger uh, with the TSX, and Luke was presenting the, uh, the benefits of the, uh, the Maple uh, transaction. I jumped on a plane, flew back here, and we were in this exact room. Uh, my boss, our CEO, Tom Cluett, was here with Xavier Role, who is the CEO of the London Stock Exchange, again presenting to a group very similar to this on the benefits at that time of the proposed London Stock Exchange deal. So it was a heck of a day, and it's sort of fitting, I think, to be back in the same room uh, to talk to you. And of course, a lot has changed uh, since, uh, since that day. Um, Luke, Luke Bertrand is now one of our board members and, and uh, most valued uh, partners. Um, the Maple transaction has gone ahead, and uh, we're, all, uh, we're all driving forward. So a lot took place, and I'll address, I think, a lot of the, re or I hope to address a lot of the reasons um, why we've been so supportive of that. Um, as, we, uh, as we've moved forward. Uh, I'd also like to put the Maple uh, transaction into the broader context of what's occurring internationally among various exchange groups and what's going on with mergers and acquisitions um, in the, uh, in the uh, world of exchanges and how that relates back to both the evolving marketplace in Canada uh, but also the importance of what is going on at the uh, international level and why th we think it's very uh, important to uh, to be, to be part of that. Um, I think as you probably know, the, the Maple uh, Acquisition Corporation acquired um, three, three companies, of course, the TMX Group, um, uh, CDS, the Canadian Depository for Securities, which is the clearing and depository for, uh, for equities transactions and fixed income transactions in Canada, and then our former competitor, now part of our group, um, the Alpha Trading System, which was a fascinating experience over the last four years because, of course, we were in this incredible position in Canada where as the TMX group, our largest customers who controlled about 50% of the trading flow of equities in Canada were also the owners of our biggest competitor in Alpha. So it was a fascinating uh, time in markets. And I, I know um, my, my uh, friendly competitor and now colleague Josh Schmidt has, uh, has addressed this group before. And I'll just say that it's been a fascinating experience to have been across the street uh, from each other uh, competing for several years and of course um, now moving into a, uh, a new era. 
But I think the, the one big sort of observation I'd start off with is a lot of what underlies what's going on in the world of exchanges, and then particularly here in Canada, really comes down to globalization. And do we want to participate in globalization? Our answer at the TMX group has very much been yes, and it may interest you to know that the Maple transaction is actually the third transaction in about two and a half years that related to um, making the TMX group a stronger participant and a stronger world competitor. Um, you know about the London Stock Exchange deal, which was announced in February of 2011. That was actually chapter two, as various newspapers had reported, and as we disclosed in our information circular, uh, that was actually the second transaction we had been negotiating with another international exchange group. Uh, prior to that one, that one stalled at the gates. Then, of course, we had the proposed London Stock Exchange deal, um, and I will talk in more detail about that. Uh, the issue there, of course, was very much around Canadian sovereignty. And then we moved into the Maple uh, transaction where the issue became very much around conflict and concentrated ownership. And I will uh, we'll deal with all of those. So to kick off and maybe just talk, uh, set the stage, talk a little bit about the London uh, Stock Exchange a proposal really by way of contrasting to the Maple transaction. For us, that was again all about globalization and how do we effectively participate in the globalization of stock exchanges. As the New York Stock Exchange comes into Canada to compete for our listings and our investor flow, as NASDAQ did the same, as the London Stock Exchange itself did, uh, both it and through its junior market, the alternative investment market known as AIM, came into Canada, how do we respond to that? And our response very much was to also participate on the global stage. And when you think about participating on the global stage, for us it's really about, first of all, our Canadian issuers. How do we continue to assure for them deeper pools of both domestic but also foreign capital as, um, as the capital markets become increasingly uh, transnational and competitive? And how do we provide for greater liquidity and lower cost of financing? And the premise of the London Stock Exchange deal was very much about taking all of our Canadian issuers, which I will talk more about in a few moments, and raising the profile of those issuers on the international stage so that as capital is competing as to where it flows, that they would have a big part of that. The other thing, of course, was Canadian investors. And in this increasingly global world, giving uh, more and more opportunities for investors to have greater choice um, for investing, but also lower execution costs. At the heart of it, exchanges are very much applied technology companies. We process transactions. And the more transactions we process over our, our uh, base of technology, of course, the greater efficiencies that we can uh, bring to that. Beyond that very important core of Canadian issuers and Canadian investors and bringing them more choice and opportunity, there was also a consideration around you know, global capital markets participants, attracting global issuers. In a few moments, I'll talk more about our international issuer base, which presents more opportunity for investors in Canada and how competitive that is as companies increasingly seek beyond their own borders as they uh, look for capital. Um, you know, very close to this audience, portfolio and fund managers are making decisions every day internationally about where to deploy capital. It's very important that we are part of that. And at the end of the day, I think all of that contributes, um, as we have in the past, to a growing um, Canadian uh, economy. So when we, when we boil, I think, the London Stock Exchange uh, deal down, it was very much about greater profile and financing opportunities for, uh, for issuers and more international trading flows and liquidity for traders and greater investment choice uh, for investors. And the core issue in all of this, as we went out and talked to constituencies, talked to government agencies, et cetera, the core issue, of course, was sovereignty. And whether or not people felt that Canada was giving up too much in that transaction. That transaction had been very heavily negotiated in terms of the division of the management between the various uh, centers and what was offered. Uh, we certainly felt it was the right way forward. Uh, one thing I'll never forget is on that day in February of 2011 when the deal was announced, uh, we labeled it a merger of equals. We very strongly believed it was a merger of equals. I came home, came in the front door, my kids ran to the front and said, you know, it looks very exciting, but I'm not so sure about this phrase, merger of equals. But uh, notwithstanding, we went out to the street. We did, in fact, get a majority of shareholder support for that, but under Canadian corporate law, uh, we needed uh, two-thirds. And that deal, of course, became a thing of the past. And then we moved on with the Maple transaction. And I think one of the most important things about the Maple transaction to talk about in the context of, of my theme today is really what, what does it mean for globalization? 
I think on its face, if you look at that world map I've thrown up in the red circle over at the left, uh, Maple is very obviously um, a domestic deal in the sense of ownership and the financial institutions coming to the table. The London Stock Exchange was on its face uh, very much more of an international deal. But notwithstanding that, as we entered into um, discussions with the Maple Group, the fundamental premise of the TMX Group continuing to participate in globalization, which we saw as being vital for the corporation but also vital uh, for Canadian capital markets participants, was one of the first things on the table. And the Maple Group very early endorsed that strategy, endorsed that vision, and on that basis, um, we were able to move ahead. And of course, there were other elements of this transaction that were different. It was very much an integrated exchange model as we brought in the Canadian Depository uh, for Securities, and of course, Alpha, which had been a, uh, another marketplace uh, you know, competing at that time against Toronto Stock Exchange and TSX Venture Exchange. And it was very much about building that integrated exchange model with domestic strength, uh, so that we could offer greater investment and activity, of course, uh, globally competitive pricing, and a new, backer, a new group of backers of investment, investors that would allow us greater opportunity to go back onto the world stage and make sure that we continue our international growth. And again, I'll talk about that in a little bit more uh, detail um, in, dis in just a moment. But if the, I think if the, you know, one of the core propositions there, really, if you look at the, the chart I have up, is, is domestic strength translating into global uh, competitiveness. Now, to put all of that into the uh, overall international background of M&A, there has been a lot of M&A activity in the exchange space uh, over the last decade and more. Some of the more uh, higher profile transactions, like the proposed merger between the New York Stock Exchange and the Deutsche Börse in Germany, um, which failed, also the proposed uh, transaction between the Singapore Exchange and Australia, which also failed, you know, have obviously gathered a lot of attention. But it's worth noting that there are still several other transactions that are going ahead. For example, recently the Hong Kong Exchange purchased the London Metals Exchange. Um, with more of a domestic flavor, the Tokyo Stock Exchange and Osaka are uh, getting together. And of course, we've heard the rumors of the uh, Singapore Stock Exchange and London uh, potentially uh, speaking. Prior to all of that, there had been another wave of mergers, some of them transnational and some of them domestic. Notwithstanding the high profile failure of the merger or proposed merger between the New York Stock Exchange and the Deutsche Börse, previously the New York Stock Exchange had merged with Euronex, which itself was a collection of exchanges um, across Western Europe. And so many of these um, um, exchange groups already had an international flavor. One of the things I enjoyed thinking about at the time where Maple was coming onto the scene and we had the London Stock Exchange uh, proposed uh, transaction live was when you looked across that big pond, the Atlantic Ocean, and you looked at the London Stock Exchange, there was an interesting situation where you had a 200-year-old iconic stock exchange in the London Stock Exchange headed up by a Frenchman who had, and, and the group had previously purchased the Italian exchanges. So it gives you a sense, I think, that in many other jurisdictions, there already was a great international flavor. But I think one of the most important waves of mergers to think about as we think about changes in the exchange space is the changes that we went through right here in Canada between about 1999 and 2001 um, with the realignment of exchanges and then later with the acquisition of the Montreal Exchange by the TMX group. But back in 1999, there was various exchanges in Canada, both regional and national, that were competing with each other. Uh, the exchanges got together and realigned specialties so that the Toronto Stock Exchange became the place for senior equities, the newly formed Canadian Venture Exchange became uh, the place for junior equities, and the Montreal Exchange became the place for derivatives. Um, and as I always like to joke about the Venture Exchange, that was five regional markets coming together, Vancouver, um, the Alberta Stock Exchange, Winnipeg, the over-the-counter market here in Ontario, and the junior list of Montreal, those five pieces came together and again, as I like to joke, uh, the sum was greater than its parts. So just two years later, um, the Toronto Stock Exchange in August of 2001 bought the whole venture exchange back and brought it under the TSX umbrella. And I will speak more about that, but that was a transformative change. But at that same time, we saw many of the same kinds of issues that had been de debated in Canada around the London 
deal. So for example, many in the West felt that bringing the venture exchange under the Toronto Stock Exchange would be dangerous. That the things that had been nurtured in the West and had uh, you know, formed the underpinnings of such a vibrant and successful junior exchange um, would be in effect suffocated by the Toronto Stock Exchange. And as I'll show you in a moment, I think you know, the vision uh, for those who were involved who had the opposite vision that the opportunity would be growth, I think that's really come to transpire. But in, in many ways we had the same debate on the domestic stage back then that we've had more recently around some of the, um, the international um, proposals. So as the market continues to evolve, there's no question that we have to deal um, with all of these um, issues. And one of the very important things to keep in mind is that in Canada, we do have world-leading, internationally competitive aspects to our capital markets. And to speak specifically about our public equity markets, there's lots of competitive advantages that we can take onto the world stage as world competitors are increasingly coming you know, into Canada. Um, for one, we have a very, very strong domestic market that serves all size of companies, from the smallest nanocap company to the largest blue chip. And then in areas of international competition, we have three, I think, that really cause us to stand out. The first won't surprise you. Uh, that's resources in both mining uh, and energy. The second is financial services, again, very high profile in the last uh, few years. The one that may not resonate with you quite as much, but we are definitely now considered the world leader here, is small and medium enter enterprise generally. Um, we have developed between the TSX Venture Exchange and the, uh, and the Toronto Stock Exchange uh, what others, like the CEO of NASDAQ, the CEO of the London Exchange, um, openly call the world's best two-tier exchange system. And it has very much become the foundation uh, for our success uh, with capital or public equity markets in particular um, uh, here in Canada. And we are indisputably the leader in using public markets to help nurture early stage companies. And I do want to offer up one qualifier. Uh, anytime I say we, I really mean the royal we. And it's everybody who participates in public equity markets in Canada. The exchange is certainly the platform and the focal point, uh, but it is very much around the advisors, the brokers, uh, the investment bankers, the issuers themselves, of course, the analysts, uh, the mining engineers, um, the geologists, et cetera. And that entire ecosystem um, has come together to make us uh, very much um, world, uh, world beating. And to give you just a bit of a sense of that, this is what I like to refer to as the American slide. Uh, we often consider ourselves as Canadians to be somewhat modest. Uh, we've tried to step outside of ourselves a little bit this one and just <laughs> identify for you many of the areas where we are world leading. Um, and again, this is, you know, I'm using the royal we here. In 2011, prior to that in 2010 and prior to that in 2009, the TSX exchanges, Toronto Stock Exchange and TSX Venture, led the world number one three years in a row for the number of new listings coming onto the exchange. And in 2012, we continue to be in number one position, notwithstanding that the uh, financial markets are having a, a tougher time. We're number two in the world in terms of the total number of listed companies. So with almost 4,000 listed issuers, there's only, it's only one, a stock exchange group in India, that has more listings uh, than we do. And that very much goes right to the heart of the value proposition of the two-tier exchange system, where we accommodate companies from the earliest stages right up uh, blue chip through to the later stages. All of this is on a basis of regulatory um, um, uh, controls. We view our job very much as putting in place the minimum regulatory control so that we manage regulatory risk as companies come into the marketplace, and then all of you and others on the street manage the investment risk. Um, and that's been our premise, and it has worked um, extremely well in terms of, the, uh, of, of how this uh, system has worked. It probably won't surprise you to learn that we're number one in the world in terms of public uh, mining companies. 60% of the entire world's population of mining companies that are public are listed on either the TSX or the TSX Venture Exchange. But between them, by the way, they have about 10,000 mining projects uh, with about half of those within Canada and a full almost 5,000 outside of Canada. So Canadians are very much dominating this on the world stage. Similar with energy companies. Take the whole world's population of public energy companies, about 35% are listed on TSX and TSX Venture. Um, maybe slightly more surprising, we're either number two or three in the world, depending on the latest stats in terms of number of technology companies. So we all think about NASDAQ when we think about technology, and certainly they have the larger 
uh, market cap stocks, but we also have a very strong uh, component of technology companies. And number one in the world in terms of the number of listed clean technology companies. Uh, the Canadian public equity markets are very much developing into the, uh, into the or a world leader there with about 140 uh, clean technology companies. But probably the most important statistic of all, I think, is in terms of equity financing. So how much equity financing is occurring uh, by our listed companies, those 4,000 listed companies? And for a country of just over 30 million people, uh, we are sixth in the world. Again, the royal we. We are sixth in the world in terms of financing uh, companies in the public markets. We've always been in the top 10 as long as we've been keeping our statistics, and we've continued uh, to move up through those ranks. And that's great testament by the way, to the appetite of Canadian investors uh, to hold equities, where we have roughly 50% of Canadians uh, directly or indirectly invested in equities, which is a much higher percentage uh, than you would see um, in, other, uh, in other areas. And this has become very attractive um, on the world stage. Um, we have just crossed about 350 international listings, so uh, uh, companies from Australia, uh, Latin America, Western Europe, United Kingdom, uh, the United States, of course, which is our biggest source, China, are increasingly come uh, to list in Canada and then finance not only domestically in Canada, but as international investors finance through the Canadian exchanges, um, tap into that financing as well. Um, it might interest you to know that the 350 um, international listings that we have, about half are in resources but about half are just in non-resources in the small and medium enterprise generally, uh, area generally. Again, going to that value proposition uh, that we have that relates to small and medium enterprise. It is one of our calling cards on the world stage. About 80% of all of our 4,000 listed companies are under 250 million in market cap. And the rate at which we've had companies graduate from our junior TSX Venture Exchange to the senior Toronto Stock Exchange is absolutely, um, I would say, outstanding or even to some people, uh, astonishing. We've had about 650 companies since the Venture Exchange was formed in 1999 graduate from the Venture Exchange to the Senior Toronto Stock Exchange. And that 650 compares to the world's most, second most successful two-tier exchange system, which would be London and AIM, and in that same period has had about 70 companies. So we've had 10 times as many move up over that same period. And over and above that, if you look at the S&P TSX Composite Index today, 25% of the companies in that composite by number, one out of every four, come from our venture exchange. So this has been a, an incredible opportunity for early stage companies to finance and also for investors to be able to get in more on the ground floor in an area of venture capital where traditionally it's really restricted to high net worth in, uh, investors who qualify, for example, for the accredited investor exemption. And even if you get in, it's much diffi more difficult to diversify. We have an exchange where people can participate in early stage investments on a very broadly um, diversified basis. In addition to financing and listing, um, we are increasingly having international traders and portfolio managers uh, trade uh, through, through our exchanges. About 40% of the trading every day on the Toronto Stock Exchange comes from outside of Canada. Our biggest source of that inflow uh, is the United States, and we're increasingly seeing flows coming from uh, Western Europe and other places. We run very, very extensive uh, international programs every year to continue to grow um, you know, the profile of our, um, our, our issuers and our trading opportunities uh, internationally. For example, last year we did over 200 events in 45 cities in 15 countries. A big part of what we're doing is also an international buy side program uh, where to date we've been out to see almost 200 international buy side uh, portfolio and fund managers uh, based for example in Zurich, Geneva, New York, London, um, et cetera, um, to raise with them the, you know, the profile and the opportunity to invest uh, in Canadian uh, listed companies. So just to start to, uh, to close off, um, I think when you wrap all of those things together, uh, the various things that we've seen going on on the international stage uh, with exchange uh, merger and acquisition activity, the things we've seen in terms of international exchange groups continually and increasingly scouring the globe uh, for opportunities for, uh, for market uh, participation, uh, we've tried to play along with others a, a leading role in making Canada both a trading um, and an investment destination. 
We're seeing that through an increasing number of international listings at Seek uh, Capital here, but also through uh, an increasing participation by international traders and portfolio managers who are coming uh, to trade uh, here as well. Um, we believe it's uh, very important to uh, continue to do that. It's important to keep uh, Canada relevant, and we think that the Maple transaction itself, by giving us that very strong domestic base and alignment on the domestic stage, um, does in fact help us uh, move forward in, in that regard. And I think I'd like to close um, with a quote. I was recently at a trading conference and uh, Don Cox from, from BMO, I thought had a great, uh, a great quote, which is that the competitive position of Canada has never been better and our future uh, opportunities are brighter than ever. We're certainly trying to take up and be one of the standard bearers for that. Um, and again, uh, on behalf of, uh, as part of that big royal we, on behalf of, um, of all participants in the Canadian uh, capital markets. So I think with that, I'd like to, I think I'm right on time, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have been here today, and I would be really pleased to take any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, I knew I should have planted a few. <laughs> yes, thank you. Well, um, we, are, we are very involved with companies that are going public and uh, you know, there's various routes for companies to go public. One's the traditional IPO, initial public offering. There's also mergers by way of um, either reverse mergers or our uh, proprietary product called the CPC, Capital Pool Company Program, which is a form of reverse merger. So we're very involved with that in the sense that um, we don't list anything unless it meets either the senior listing standards of the Toronto Stock Exchange or the standards of the Junior Venture Exchange. Um, we're, not, we're not actually out you know, as part of the transaction, which is really undertaken by the companies and their advisors, uh, but we see all of them as they come into the public markets. Well, as a, uh, I will tell you, as a great Canadian icon, we're, we're, we'll be thrilled to see, uh, you know, Hudson's Bay uh, come back into the public market, and it's something uh, we certainly look forward to. Yes? Well, I think that the, the ecosystem of investments is all complementary. And for example, we often get challenged with that around the fact that we run a venture exchange that's geared at early stage companies. Even the Toronto Stock Exchange itself has many small and medium enterprises listed that would be candidates to stay in the private market. And I think the most important thing is that we provide as many tools as possible uh, for both uh, you know, Canadian companies to grow, whether that be by private equity or public, and as many opportunities as possible for investors. On the first one, um, we rarely see um, you know, it, it necessarily a competition between private and public equity. I think companies have different circumstances and different stories. Some of them lend themselves to the private equity market, some to public, some to both. We've seen many private equity players um, manage their portfolios by, you know, spinning some companies into the public realm and keeping others um, on the private side. I would go back to one of my earlier comments, though, around, um, you know, when you get to the investor side as well. I do think one of the beauties we have in Canada with such a broad uh, list of public companies is again that um, people who are looking for early stage investment opportunities can do that on a broadly diversified basis. The private equity world, um, it's a tougher nut to crack. Again, you have to be accredited or meet some other exemption to get into it. And if you do get into it, the exemptions are high, there's a lot of money at stake and it's tougher to diversify. Um, on, on something like the venture exchange, you have the opportunity to come in at a, 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 as low a entry fin a financial entry threshold as you want and to diversify across as many uh, companies as you want. I think more broadly, the public markets will, will, will come and go in cycles, as will private equity. Private equity has gone through um, some tough times over the last uh, 10 years as well. We're all currently dealing with the challenges of, um, of the, you know, the current financial uh, condition, public markets activity is uh, down somewhat, uh, but I wouldn't count it out. It's a, a very important tool for growing an economy and it's a very important tool for growing companies and its relevance will be here, I think, for many, many a century to come. Uh, hi. hi. Thanks, Kevin. Um, Kevin, uh, around the time of the deal, once it was done, uh, there was some uh, commentary from the federal government around 
essentially the regulatory framework um, going forward in this new uh, world of, of uh, merged exchanges. Care to comment really, without getting into a lot of detail uh, clearly, but uh, care to comment on you know, what you see in terms of the regulatory framework? Is it, is it you know, tougher standards or are we still competitiveness, you know, competitive internationally from a regulatory stand, standpoint? You know, considering that the government of Canada has really held its, uh, you know, standards very high in terms of talking of financial services and other types of regulatory uh, standards out there, you know, surpassing the, uh, the financial crisis, et cetera. Great, thank you. Thank you for the question. I, I think I'd choose to answer it at two levels. Uh, first, as it relates to TMX Group itself, and secondly, as it relates to our, you know, our capital markets and a lot of the companies that are listed on our exchanges. Uh, certainly with the TMX Group itself, um, it's very much a brave new world. Um, there was, um, you know, as I had mentioned, the London deal was very much about sovereignty, but as we moved into the Maple deal, very much about uh, conflicts and concentrated ownership. And consequently, I think between, um, you know, the four main Canadian securities commissions that were involved, the AMF in Quebec, Ontario, BC, and Alberta, plus the Federal Competition Bureau, um, there was a tremendous amount of work done as to what should go into the recognition order, which is the means by which we are licensed by the securities commissions uh, to conduct business. Um, those recognition orders, which are public, um, have changed uh, heavily in terms of the oversight of the exchanges. So we are uh, very much operating within the framework of, of regulation that is uh, very focused on, are, you know, are we remaining competitive? Are we providing you know, fair access to participants in public markets? Um, you know, how are we pricing? How are we interacting with, uh, with other players? So I think there is a very strong regulatory framework in place that will address those concerns um, but it's not so overwhelming that it will hinder us as a, uh, as a you know, competitive and innovative enterprise. Uh, moving to the companies, uh, you know, there's lots of debate, uh, both in response to the financial crisis and then historically in Canada with you know, the fragmented uh, oversight in terms of um, various securities commissions on the uh, provincial level. Um, I will say that at that level, I think Canada has done a very good job of, of finding the right balance. Uh, one of the things that would immediately come to mind uh, was several years ago, uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, a very big move in the United States um, in a reaction to many of the um, accounting scandals that had occurred in the United States. Uh, we were one of several voices in Canada that said, be careful. Uh, Canada is very highly regarded on the international um, um, stage for our uh, corporate governance standards. Uh, we have an incredibly well-functioning two-tier uh, public market system and because we cater so much to small and medium enterprise we have to make sure that we don't overwhelm those companies and we didn't there, were, there was a balance that was struck we did not go as far as Sarbanes-Oxley we do have the right protections in place but I think we managed to uh, to get through that um, in, in, you know relatively well um, with the fragmented securities commissions it's a very big debate on the home stage but I will tell you that we as I mentioned we have 350 international issuers and by and large when they uh, come to Canada they do deal with one jurisdiction on the passport system so it's um, notwithstanding there may be other you know things to debate in that context in terms of international competitiveness um, I think you know it's, it's worked out um, you know so far relatively well so I think there's lots of layers to that question but by and large um, my my short answer would be um, after that long answer. Um, I don't think any of the regulation has got to the point where we are, you know, um, you know um, compromising our competitiveness. There may be ways that we can make ourselves even more competitive. Well, if, uh, if there are no more questions, um, thank you uh, very, very much. Thank you, uh, Kevin, uh, for really a very, very succinct uh, presentation on the, uh, the recent evolution in our uh, exchange systems uh, and actually more history even uh, than what has happened over the last couple of uh, years. Certainly, uh, it's important that we as uh, financial advisors understand this particular part uh, of the industry as we are uh, working and meeting with our clients. It's uh, now my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Rick Annard, who is the President and CEO of uh, Manulife Securities. Rick really has his finger on the pulse of the financial services industry. He has developed an impressive resume in the financial services industry in the areas of insurance, mutual funds, 
and banking and trusts. Rick was appointed president and CEO of Manual Life Securities in 2005 and has continued in that role with the amalgamation of Berkshire Group into Manual Life Securities. You will recall in my opening remarks this morning my reference to the value of advice. Well, this afternoon, Rick will be discussing recent research supporting the value professional financial advisors provide Canadian investors. Advice is key to the creation of wealth, and it's becoming increasingly important to ensure your clients truly understand your value proposition and the impact you have on their investing and savings habits. So ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Rick Annert. Rick. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, I, I wanted to start uh, by saying how pleased I am to be here today, and I am very pleased. But, but I do have to say there was a bit of an awkward moment this morning when Mr. Lee Chin was starting to talk about the sale of his company, Berkshire, and getting those $39 shares. Well, I'm the guy that gave him the $39 shares. <laughs> uh, May Life is very proud to support the important work the Advocates does on behalf of its members. It's important to the industry that financial advisors have strong representations and a body that advances the professionalism advice and advises themselves. I'm here today to talk about advice and the value you provide Canadians as professional financial advisors. Many before me today talked about flaws and concerns, and I'm here to talk about the industry itself and many of the strengths that you provide Canadians every day. As a financial advisor, you are positioned to help your clients think and organize the things that they need to do to meet their financial and their life goals. Much of the services you provide are like those of a personal trainer. You help your clients with their financial needs by identifying their goals and their weaknesses. You establish a plan. You keep your clients on track, which may not always be easy in these tough times that we see today. And more importantly, you adjust their plans as their circumstances do change. That's a pretty important role to play. And I know all of you in this room do not take that lightly. As advice is garnering quite a bit of attention these days. And some of it, unfortunately, is not very positive. Some economists and pundits believe advisors are dead weight. That Canadians would do better by managing their own investments and saving the cost of working with an advisor. Because of that, more and more organizations are doing studies to evaluate the impact advice has on the investing and saving habits of Canadians. And the results show what we've known all along, that advice matters and financial advisors help Canadians. The bottom line, Canadians are better off with professional advice. In 2010 and 2011, the Investment Funds Institute of Canada released reports on the value of advice. These reports were based on surveys done by Ipsos Reid and Polera. The key findings of these reports were that advised households have double the participation, double the participation in RSPs and TFSAs of households without advice. They have nearly triple the participation in RIFs and RESPs of households without advice. Save more regardless of income and age than the non-advised peers. And investors who work with an advisor are 33% more likely to feel empowered and educated than those who invest without advice. Now, as you can see from this chart, the EFIC research showed that people working with a financial advisor have significantly more investable assets across all age groups. However, the skeptics said that this was just a clear indication that advisors only work with Canadians who have significant wealth. In fact, what they are truly argue is that advisors don't create wealth, they chase it. Well, we need to dispel that myth. Now, it's important to understand how some of the pundits view advice. It starts with the premise that markets are efficient and that you cannot beat the market. 
Therefore, you should only invest in low-cost ETFs that match the market. They look at the basis points that are, that are charged for, the, for paying for advice as lowering the returns to the investor. They believe, in the most part, that the cost of advice does not benefit and therefore Canadians would be, did not benefit Canadians, and therefore Canadians on average would be better off managing their own investments. Ultimately, all they think is about returns. Of course, all of you in the room know it's more than that. It's not the truth. Adequate returns are important. There's no argument to that. But that's not all of it. It's as much or more about the discipline instilled in clients to save and plan properly for their future. I'm just going to go back one. The bottom line is that we need a balance. I'm going to borrow a quote from a paper published by the Association for Savings and Investment in South Africa. They summed up the key findings from the studies in South Africa um, and they say this, it's much like turning a screw, too loose and it will not hold, too tight and you can strip the thread. I really couldn't have said that better myself. The industry needs to ensure that advice is available to everyone. If the perception is that advice costs too much, a vast majority of people that need it will go without. And that's just bad for everyone. Fortunately, recent research shows that there's significant value to working with an advisor, and we, all of us, need to spread that message. Greg mentioned it earlier, there's a Serrano report. This new report is Canada's largest and most scientific survey to date on the topic of the value advice. But first, a little background on Serrano. Serrano is a research centre that brings together a number of researchers from several universities in Quebec. Its purpose is to create and transfer knowledge on the analysis of organisations and it facilitates research in a variety of disciplines economics, finance, management, information systems, computer science, psychology, sociology, political science, law, history and medicine. The Serrano group studied the use of the data from Ipsos Reid to conduct a uh, survey, a thorough one, using econometric modelling and a robust sampling of Canadian investors. Serrano researchers were able to single out the effects of advice on asset accumulation after accounting for more than 50 other variables that also influence wealth accumulation. Greg talked about it earlier, 18,000 households were involved and it narrowed down to 3,610 responses to follow up on. The responses were broken down into three categories. We need to keep break this out, uh, the support piece. Houses with advice, so that's 44% of the cohort sorry, 49%. There is another cohort that represents 51%, but when you do the math on a, on a slide I'm going to show you, it comes up to just shy, but I think it's just rounding error. 44% of the households without advisors, and there's a cohort that we would call do-it-yourselfers, and the study calls these traders, but let's just call these financially literate do-it-yourselfers who are very disciplined. This is a pretty complicated slide and I certainly don't expect you to read it all right now, so I'll try to break it down. Initially, the group respondents were in two, the 49% that had advice and the 51% that didn't. Then they distinguished between the two types of non-advice households. Those who didn't receive advice because they considered themselves capable of managing their own investments. These are the traders I talked about. In general, those in the traders group are older, with higher incomes, they have more education, and they have a higher level of financial illiteracy than those that are non-advice households. We all know that there will always be a group that won't seek advice, much like elite athletes that are motivated and knowledgeable enough to train on their own and do not seek the use of a trainer to keep them on their own personal goals. But these are not the average investors in Canada, and so the researchers studied them separately. So we will move on to the 44% that aren't receiving advice, and you'll see some startling statistics. 81% of the people 
without advice think that they don't have enough money to actually warrant advice. 68% think that advice is too expensive. And if you can believe it, 13% declare that they will never save for retirement. If this isn't a group of people in dire need of professional advice, I actually don't know who is. When Serrano did the study, they did an incredibly deep dive into all of the respondents. A host of socioeconomic, demographic, and attitudinal information was collected so that all asset levels could be compared for households that were effectively identical in all respects except for their use of advice. The key findings were very much in keeping with the IFIC study. One, advice has a positive and significant impact on financial assets. But this isn't just explained by asset performance. Investors with an advisor have a greater savings discipline and, is, and this too plays an important role in the asset growth. Advice positively impacts retirement readiness. And three, advice is an important contributor to levels of client satisfaction and the trust in their advisor. Another important finding, again, keeping with IFIC study, is that most investors start using an advisor when they have modest investable assets, those assets less than $50,000. So it's less about performance and it's a really about the advice. How many of us know clients who you have to persuade to start saving? You have to put down a plan. You're part of holding their hand to stay committed. How many of them do you call to make an RSP contribution every year? to remind them that they have this need and to keep them on that plan. And how many of you had long conversations with your clients when they want to withdraw money to go buy that, uh, that toy they want to have, that Harley Davidson, or whatever it is that they're looking for to go play with? And you tell them the trade-offs that you have with taking the money today on their financial future, in their financial future. Those chats, that discipline, the collective we, working on behalf of the clients to have better lives. That's what really adds value. It's so interesting to note that much like the pundits I referred to earlier, Claude Mombriquet, the economist who conducted the analysis, has admitted that he too was skeptical and did not expect to find a, a strong positive correlation between advice and wealth accumulation. And guess what? He actually proved himself wrong. There we go. I'm going to push these all in, get these all in, okay? This was supposed to st stack all at once. Let me get the whole slide in. Oops. Sorry, everyone. This was supposed to stack up all at once. Okay, there's the slide. When it comes to measuring the value of a device, the chart lays it out quite nicely. In a devised household, that has worked with a financial advisor from four to six years accumulates 58% more assets than a non-advised household that is identical in all other respects. Make that seven to 14 years and the number moves to 99% or more. And after 15 years or more with an advisor, you jump to 173% more assets. The numbers themselves don't lie. So back to skeptics think financial advisors chase wealth. Well, the reality is Financial advisors create wealth. Client perception. So far, everything I've talked about proves that clients need advice. But it's interesting to note how clients with an advisor perceive the value of that advice. Economic models determine that advised households feel more confident. They will have enough money to retire comfortably. They have a positive perception of their financial advisors. They have higher level of trust towards financial advisors and are satisfied with the services and advice they received. Now, here's the kicker. Advice, advised clients understand the value of advice. And most investors started working with an advisor when they had less than $50,000. But 44% of non-advised households do not think that they have enough money to work with an advisor. 
that is a huge opportunity for all of you here in the room. Canada currently has a population of 34 million people. If we look at the non-advised cohort we've been examining here today, the problem is evident. Not enough savings result in pressure on our social systems. This group of non-advised individuals is going to retire one day and they won't have adequate savings to support them. I couldn't be more clear that these people need advice before they get to that position. Financial advisors instill in their clients the importance of saving regularly and maintaining a discipline, a savings discipline throughout the execution of their plan. The one thing many skeptics don't consider is how a financial advisor builds a relationship with their clients, how they ask the questions that people need to be asked when preparing for a client's retirement and a financial plan. Questions like, what are you going to do? This is more about the value is not just about the economics and having the savings. The value of the chats you have with your clients. How many of you sit down and talk to your clients about what will they do when they retire? What's going to fill their days? How many of you had clients that have gone out? Because you've all learned from your experiences, right? You have had clients that have gone out, they've, they've accumulated all this wealth, and they fi finally have that milestone. They get to retire. They go on that first trip, and they come back, and what happens? They don't know what to do, right? You help them by those experiences. You help more and more Canadians learn that they have to have plans for plans, that they have to know what to do the day after they come back from that trip. What's going to fill their day? Is that not value of advice? It's more than returns, everyone. It's questions like this that most people just don't think of, and many of the pundits and the, uh, the critics of our business don't think about. Canadians will need more than money to survive, but they don't necessarily consider what they're going to do to fill their days. The Serrano research confirms that this fundamental behavioral change is most likely the root of higher asset growth and experienced advised investors. And s since there's an obvious misperception around how much money you need to use a financial advisor and how much advice costs, you end up with an amazing marketing opportunity. Not only is there a whole cohort of people out there who need advice, they don't even know that they can afford it. So I encourage you out to go out and speak. The challenges we face. So we've kind of gone through a bit of a SWOT analysis here. We know that your strength is advice. The weakness is that investor perception of who, work with, of who advisors work with you know, we don't work with just the people who have wealth. We create wealth. We just talked about the opportunities, and now we're going to get to the threats. Sorry. Media pundits have been on a roll with their attack on advice and, and you know, portraying that advisors are too expensive. Essentially, they're slandering everyone in this room, implying that investors choose to work with uh, with an advisor and are happy with, with their services, these people actually think that those people are uninformed. Not quite smart enough to figure it out. That's one heck of an insult, in my view. As we've seen from the data presented here today, they really should be recommending advice and not scaring people away from that advice. The fact is, research shows conclusively that good advice makes a meaningful difference to the financial lives of people compared to those of people who do not receive advice, even after the costs are taken into account. You have to remind your clients of your value proposition. It's the old saying, price is what you pay, value is what you get. Reinforce that you are not a drag on their returns. Research shows that professionals like yourselves provide demonstrable value to clients. You improve their financial literacy. They develop a culture of savings and investments. You assist in the development and execution of a financial plan. You help them select the appropriate financial vehicles and products, and you improve their investment decision making. The bottom line is that having a financial advisor contributes positively and significantly to the accumulation of financial wealth. 
Simply put, Canadian investors really do need advice. In closing, I'm running a little quick here. The, uh, the UK, Australia, and the US have already implemented bans or caps on commissions or embedded fees. But there were real and fundamental issues in those countries that actually don't exist in Canada. Yet, it's in danger of happening here too. When Finance Minister Flaherty talks about Canadians being concerned that Canadians aren't saving for their, uh, for their future, their retirement, and Governor Carney talks about the rampant consumer debt in Canada, their concerns are not about those advised Canadians, it's actually really about those that don't have advice. We cannot let the focus be purely on returns rather than the creation of wealth. The perception that advisors really don't add value is flat out misinformed, and the data I presented here today will actually help you provide that, prove that. Advocates, IFIC, CLHIA, Manulife, and other advocates for advice, we're all working for you in the advice industry. We need you to stand up for the value of advice because it really does matter. In closing, if you haven't already done so, I highly recommend you to read through the Advocate Special Bulletin uh, prepared on October the 2nd that summarizes the Serrano Report. It's an incredible resource that I uh, really encourage you to read. Um, thank you very much for your time this afternoon and it was truly my pleasure to be here. So thanks everyone. Rick, uh, would you open to a question or two? We still uh, have a few minutes to uh, take some. So uh, please, uh, any questions uh, to Rick? Go ahead. Uh, my question is um, concerning the industry. And, you know, yes, we're talking to our politicians, and yes, we're talking to our clients. But in terms of the, the big stage, okay, again, in the macro picture, okay, why aren't large companies, you know, advertising the results of these surveys? saying that they should get in touch with their advisors. I mean, why aren't the large companies doing that? Because we need, you know, repetition is the name of the game, and the more places we repeat it, the better off our chances of it being successful and getting that message heard loud and clear. Um, I can't speak for all companies. No, you know. okay. <laughs> but you can't speak for one. I can't speak for one. Um, and if, if you've noticed, you know, the, uh, the tagline that we use in all our corporate marketing is, life's better when you're prepared. And, and that really means seeking out professional, and, and all of our corporate adver advertising talks about go seek a, a professional financial advisor. We do that to say life is better when you have a plan. Mm -hmm. Being prepared is about having a plan. And so I, I think we, we do a pretty good job of keeping it light, reminding people that life is better when you're prepared. See your financial advisor to get that plan. I guess from my perspective, I just would like the stats to go out there because I think that, you know, in our economic climate, there's a lot of fear and I think they need, it needs to be reinforced in other ways. And if we know the stats, then it needs to be up there. And up, up I, know, I, I tend to agree with you. The, uh, the, the really nice part about the Serrano Report, it's actually very, very new. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, by, by, by the depth of the analytics that were done in this report, it actually allows it, allows it to be almost irrefutable. In the past, some of the, like you said, the pundits, uh, you know, the skeptics could say, well, you know, advisors just, they just chase wealth. This, this is the first time mm -hmm. we actually have an empirical evidence to say yeah. advisors create wealth. That's right. And I think now this allows us a platform uh, to do exactly that. And I think it's just getting our heads around how do you take this, this data now and get it out in a marketable form that, you know, the average citizen will listen to and, and understand. Thank you. Uh, it's John DeNovo from Banwell Financial. Um, we all go to doctors and we'd probably say the val that the, there's a, the value to their advice, but I think if we turn the healthcare system on its head and starting charging everybody per visit and the full cost, that there may be a reluctance to use those services. The biggest objection by uh, the Rob Carricks of the world and so on is that more the transparency of it, and that's coming. We're going to have to disclose fully all our trailer fees and this will be right in our client's face. Has any research been done to actually determine what clients are willing to pay for this valuable advice? Because I think that's the, the critical thing when 
we introduce greater transparency to the market, and I haven't seen any research on that. You know, there are, um, I haven't seen re any research at all that talks about how much a consumer is willing to pay. I, I have seen some research that, uh, that IFIC has, uh, and it talks more about the fact that Canadians, not all Canadians, actually like to see their fees being explicit. Um, you know, if you think about the way many of the consumer products are marketed uh, today, there's lots of bundles and fees. Uh, when you go to Rogers or whatever, you get bundles. And that's because many Canadians don't like explicitly being charged a tick box approach to their, to their structure. Um, so I, 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 I do agree with you. I'm, I'm not so sure that transparency actually is going to work for many Canadians. Um, we talked about how advised households understand the value of advice. That's great. I think there's a cohort in there that if they actually saw the cost of advice, might want to try to do it themselves. And, you know, that's a high risk because we see that advised households do way better than non-advised households. The other part is, is, you know, like I was trying to say, the people that are non-advised need advice. And if this is a barrier to them seeking advice, understanding the cost of it, are we better off? So it's like that turning of the screw. You know, you turn it tight enough, it just fastens. You turn it too tight, it strips the thread. Um, I'm not against transparency. I just want to make sure we do it in the right way across all the product sets and make it a level playing field. Today, some of the stuff feels very much focused on just mutual funds. And, um, you know, I'm not a proponent of that. I think we have to fix that. Um, and I'd rather, I'd rather take a step back before we take a step forward on that myself. That's just how I feel. Uh, Dean Owen from Saskatoon. Rick, in IROC's guidance notes that they had this year, uh, they talked about, retail, about uh, retail compensation structures, and they envisioned a place for both uh, commission and fee-based compensation models, depending on the client's circumstances, whatever that means. Um, do you want to give me your view on uh, the commission-based structure as viable in the long term, uh, as well as the compatible shift between the focus of that, of that regulation with the relationship focused? Well, that's a deep one. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't think I was going to come in here to talk about uh, compliance issues here. Uh, disclosure. Um, more, so, more so of the, of the idea in terms of, of the compensation models that we've got. Uh, sure. Y your, your company provides both. Yeah, we do. And, we do. and can you, you know, comment it, on what, what, what you're seeing? In, in the end, really what the, uh, what the, the regulars are really trying to get at is ensuring that whatever model you use to charge your clients, it's actually in their best interest. So in the case of a transaction-based, um, you know, if, if you're a relatively, you know, low turnover portfolio, your client doesn't trade a lot, it's in their best interest to hold, buy and hold, it actually might be best to be in a commission-based account than it would be in a fee-based account because they would pay more in fees in a fee-based account than in that transaction-based account. Now, if you're bundling a whole bunch of services around that in that fee-based account that you're not that you wouldn't be doing in a transaction-based account, well then that's a different story. Uh, if you're more active in the account, then a fee-based account probably works. As long as you're sitting down and you're 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 working with your client, letting them know which is in their best interest. Um, I think the challenge really is is uh, you know why we're getting so much oversight in this is you know there have been people particularly south of the border who with the proliferation of fee-based accounts decided it'd be a great way to take a non-trading account that was generating no revenue and turn it into a revenue generating account. And in the end, they weren't really acting into that best interest of their clients. And so, you know, we've all found that regulation tends to be when somebody does something crazy or not in the best interest of clients, you know, the regulators will turn around and create a rule that will stop you from doing that. And I think that's what they're really trying to do is get that right balance of suitability of the, of the account type, not just the investments, but the account type for their client. And, and that's really where they're trying to get to. Um, and so that means that we're going to have some rules around it. Hi, Rick. I'm Don Latchman, uh, Latchman Insurance Brokers. I've been in business since 1957, believe it or not. And I've been dealing with your company since then, but it was another company that uh, uh, merged with you, or you merged with them, or you bought them, or whatever happened. Um, 
I use your company a lot and uh, as investments and uh, uh, group insurance and everything to do with insurance. I, I, I'm a broker, I deal with them all. But um, I, yours is one that I probably give the most business to. Um, there's been some talk about you uh, as a company uh, have been buying uh, out other companies or buying or taking over other companies at various places. The newest company that you're looking at, and there's a lot of negative and positive ways of looking at this, you're looking at buying a company in China. Did you hear about this one? <laughs> and people say, China? China's not a, a company to do business with right now. They're very negative. They're very hard to do business with. They don't want to do business with, with other people around the world. What do you think about that? Do you know anything about it? <laughs> well, the bottom line is, uh, Don, I actually do not know anything about it. Uh, you know, those, uh, if you were to talk to me about the domestic securities businesses uh, and what our, 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 our strategy is around acquiring in that space and how we go about it, I could talk to you at length about that. But, uh, you know, non-domestic insurance-related activities, uh, I have to tell you, that's not my area of expertise, and I'm not actually briefed on that. Um, I tend to hear about those types of situations in the press the same way you do, uh, which means whoever is working on those, if they are working on them, is a very tightly knit group. Um, but I'm, unfortunately, I can't, actually can't answer your question. Okay. Thank you But thanks very for your much. business. <laughs> what did you say? Thanks for your business. Okay. You started by talking about how much you, you, you give us, so and thank you for that. thanks for letting me hear about you today. <laughs> Hi. Sorry. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for presenting that data. It's one of the topics that's near and dear to my heart that I've sort of never let a group get out of my sight without presenting similar research to them. Um, Advocus has already put out a uh, regulatory affairs uh, notice with information from this research. I guess I want to ask you and Advocus and, and anyone else who will get on board to prepare a very client-friendly piece with the narrative and with the materials that uh, advisors can put out to the world. I think the message behind what you've been presenting to us today is one that bears repeating a thousand times over, um, both on the advocacy side to our politicians, as you pointed out, uh, but most especially to just keep pounding at home so that the general perception of the public isn't so dominated by negative press and the presumption of guilt of advisors and instead can swing to the other direction. So I just wonder if you could tell me, if you and perhaps if Greg can also comment, if uh, that type of initiative is already in the cooker. Uh, from, our, from our perspective at, uh, at Manulife, um, particularly at Manulife Securities, not yet. Um, it's too it, new? But you know, I think you present a good idea, so uh, it's something I'm gonna take down and maybe ask our communications people to start looking into, because um, one of the things, uh, that we have done uh, at Manulife is trying to work with uh, people like Advocus, uh, like IFIC, um, to actually go get this research done. We've been uh, very much a proponents of advice. Um, we kind of felt that the research that had been done was, was good, but it needed to go to the next step. Um, and that this, the working group that, that worked with Serrano to get this done properly, uh, I think deserve a, a round of applause because, uh, you know, IFIC themselves it took a real leadership role, and there's a working group within IFIC. Um, <clears throat> and a couple of our key manual people chaired that working group to make sure that all the right evidence was presented. And not just put in a box, but let people understand the values and, and get access to all the data, complete set of data. Um, and I think that's been done. So uh, I think the first time I heard about the Serrano report was like maybe six weeks ago, uh, and, and starting to digest the findings of that, maybe eight. So it's, it's relatively new, uh, and, it's, it's, you know, and the more you read it, the more you, it's, by the way, if anyone actually grabbed the Serrano report, um, 
it's a tough read. Okay, it's uh, but it's good. It's worth it's worth the read. Don't give up on it. A uh, lot of lot of uh, well, long equations in econometric speak. Um, yeah, I, I did read it, and I know most advisors won't be able to wade through it. Uh, you have to skip a lot of sections of it. But it's that's worth why it's, I want. It's worth going through. I, I would like you guys to work to with that because that's, to that's put a great this idea. Into English. That's a great idea. I, Greg, I don't know what you. Not only advisors, but the public okay. needed in plain language. I think it's a great idea. Thanks. Okay, with that, I thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Rick. I, I just want to make a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for uh, referencing one of our regulatory affairs bulletins. Uh, we we do want to get the manufacturers out there uh, promoting uh, some of the uh, the good work that we're doing. So I certainly uh, do appreciate that. Um, m maybe I could just make a couple of comments. Uh, on a couple of questions about the Serrano study. Uh, and, I, and I actually didn't know, uh, in fact, that uh, this was the uh, specific comments that were going to be made today, so I certainly do appreciate that. Um, but in fact, um, in May, uh, Claude Bonaquet from Serrano did, actually it was really a bit earlier than that, in April, uh, did approach um, Advocus and IFIC, both of us, to sponsor a, um, an event where he would release his research. And so we did do that, I think it was May 4th, if I recall, at the King Edward Hotel. And, and we did invite um, all of the who's who in the financial services industry uh, to that event. Uh, this study, and I met with Professor Mamaket in his offices a couple of times in Montreal uh, prior to the release because I wanted to know that if our name was going on some research uh, in, in support of a particular direction, I wanted to know that it was something that we could support. Uh, I was convinced we could, uh, we could support it. Uh, we have an economist uh, on staff, Peter Zanatakis. Peter attended with me. Uh, we went through it in, in great detail, asked lots of questions. In fact, there were some refinements done based upon our questions. And at the end of the day, you have a 200-page report which is posted online. Now, um, in, the, in the research uh, industry, uh, this now has to be peer-reviewed. It, in fact, has not yet been peer-reviewed. So it has not been yet published in an academic journal, and it will be. Uh, we understand that's about a two-year process. So that's how quickly uh, the world moves in academia. So um, meanwhile, um, you know, we had this 200-page report, and um, you know, I'm just sort of being a little bit uh, humorous here. You know, I, I said to the staff, can we get this down to, you know, to a sizable, you know, amount where we can, in fact, um, use it, people can understand it, because it is, frankly, very, very complex. And I said, in fact, can we, can we distill it down even further so that we could give it to clients? So that our advisors, I mean, you know, because this, this helps us as well as an association in terms of the value that we add for financial advisors. So um, I think we have it down to four pages at this point. It's still a fairly tough read, although if I recall, I don't have it in front of me, but I think there's about five bolded lines in the four pages, and if you read just those five bolded lines, that pretty well tells the, uh, the story. So there's lots of opportunity for you as individual advisors to take that uh, monograph and to just build it into a really simple uh, newsletter, if you want, for your clients so that they can be, begin to understand how you make a difference uh, in their lives every day. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Rick, for bringing this back to our attention and for keeping it uh, alive. Um, no doubt that this is an issue, a story, I think, that's going to continue for, um, uh, frankly, many years uh, into the future. There's, there's a lot there, and I'd encourage you to read it.